Hi there, my name is Tom Love. I'm the head of content marketing here at Sport Insta Group. Thanks for joining us today for this special podcast recording on the topic of athlete welfare in collaboration with our Sport Industry Awards partner, Miller Insurance. I'm delighted to welcome to the call David Griffiths, Senior Advisor within the Sport and Entertainment Division at Miller Insurance, Matt Gentry, Co founder and Managing Director of 77 Sports Management, Sam Renouf, CEO of the Professional Triathletes Organization, and finally, Georgie Twig, MBE professional hockey player, an Olympic gold medalist, and now an associate at law firm Bird & Bird. To give some further context for those at home, earlier in the year, Sport Industry Group ran a series of polls on social media as a way of surveying the industry and gathering their thoughts on the various aspects of athlete welfare. And it's the results of those polls which will form the basis of our discussion today. David, just before we get underway, I wondered if you uh, briefly wanted to make any opening remarks on the subject of athlete welfare and perhaps explain why Miller chose it for this content series. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, um, good morning, everybody. Miller are delighted to be partnering with Sport Industry Group to explore the risk issues around athlete welfare. It's it's really important as these risks evolve that, that we get a chance to explore them and hear from industry experts on ha- how they see um, the support for, for, for athletes in these areas developing. So we're pleased, pleased to have the opportunity today. Looking forward to hearing from some of uh, my colleagues in the industry. Um, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Fantastic. Thank you, David. So I'm just going to jump straight into it. So the first question we asked our audience was, which sport did they feel was leading the way when it came to athlete welfare? Um, now, rugby came out on top. You know, I think a lot of rugby players will tell you that they are one tackle away from a career-ending injury, so uh, it was to me. It was a little bit strange to see that to see that come out on top. I was expecting football myself. And when, and when, you, and when you're talking, Tom, around athlete welfare, that's actually just on the field of play, or is it sort of anything that's you know off field in terms of sort of care and attention? And yeah, sort of I, I think I think it's the whole it's the whole um, yeah the whole span, I suppose. So obviously, the questions are slightly open ended. Um, you know, and we can't include every sport as well. But yeah, I think it's the whole the whole realm of athlete welfare. It's not just uh, it's not just on the field, which which is one of the reasons that I found it surprising. You know, given the amount of money involved in football, um, I just felt like they were the the athletes that would be treated the best in their sport. I mean, like, I'm happy to sort of to take it on. So I mean, look, we we look after sort of young footballers, young young tennis players, and I think so those, those two industries I know sort of fairly well. Um, I don't think either do an amazing job um, around athlete welfare to, as athletes reach the end of their career and looking towards transitioning. Um, football probably more so. Um, I think there needs to be lots, lots more done in education um, to help prepare people for you know what is a huge change in in their circumstance, not necessarily just financially, but also. You know, if you've got somebody retiring early or somebody, you know, even retiring sort of 30, 35, it's, it's, you know, what am I doing for the rest of my life? You know, so it's quite a big void. Um, and I, I just don't think there's enough work that goes into it from a, from a club perspective to help, to help that change. Um, and actually, if you take from a football perspective as well, even at the start, you know, of, of schoolboys players coming through, only a tiny percentage make it. And actually, the ones that don't, are almost just discarded and left to sort of fend for themselves. So actually, I think the whole process probably needs looking at right from re- at a really early age up until up until retirement. Um, would be my perspective. Do you think you've have you seen change though in recent years when it comes to that sort of thing? It feels like it's it's in the news a lot more. Yeah, I think it is, and I, I think it's very. I mean, it, 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 that's broad brush for me as well. So look, obviously, some clubs are better at it than others. Um, so it almost depends on on the management really, and 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 how invested they are um, in helping and transitioning and and potentially you know using players as part of the club outreach afterwards. But I just think more of the sort of general education pieces, whether that's tying up with local universities, whether it's tying up with local apprenticeships, or whatever it might be. Just to just to give you know kids and, and retired players a chance, I think I think a lot more could be done. Maybe local business. I wonder whether businesses. Matt, I noticed you used the word club several times there. There's a big distinction also between team-based sports and individual, right? And obviously, it's interesting to see tennis there, the only one mentioned as 
um, supporting or being the, the highest level of athlete welfare, um, I would imagine the infrastructure and support in team-based sports is significant to those where it's a solo as an individual sport. Yeah, I mean, yeah, from a tennis player perspective, exactly. I mean, you're, obviously you're on your own for you know, the vast majority of your, your career anyway. So um, you sort of fend for yourself and actually you probably have a bit more time to sort of get used to it and, and actually things get done because you do them rather than, as you say, a team-based sport where you know, everything is done for you and actually it probably doesn't help when you get to the end of the end of your career. Actually, then nothing is being done for you. So it's almost sort of a bit of a starker transition. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think even with tennis, though, I just think, you know, I think probably more needs to be done. I think because they're obviously you have the sort of management side of the of the thing, you have the sort of the federation, um, you know, so there's there's no sort of one person taking ownership of that really, um, and things maybe sort of slip by, slip through the gaps. I think often, um, you know, a lot of sports say that they have this kind of um, support network for, for athletes after sport. As you say, I think that is such a, a, a key change um, that occurs, you know, when a, when an athlete retires from professional sport and, you know, often it, it's on the individual to, to, to be proactive. Um, and I think particularly in, in high profile sports where, you know, they're earning huge sums of money, I think that probably is seen as a very low, a low priority. Um, and and actually probably needs to be driven more by the organisation or the club or the governing body um, because, you know, if it's left left to the athlete in that, that instance, I think it's probably often seen as an afterthought. And then, you know, when they, they make that transition, I think it can it can have serious consequences, you know, with, with athletes' mental health, um, you know, suddenly going from having a daily routine, a purpose, to then suddenly not, not knowing what they're going to do for the rest of their life. Um, so, so, you know, I think it's it's definitely, it lies with the organisations and the clubs to kind of do more. So do you, think, do you think something that's sort of mandatory that would force, you know, athletes to actually, you know, because I'm also thinking, you know, they don't know what they don't know really. So, you know, making them sort of perhaps try different areas, whether it's media, whether it's, you know, some business consultancy or whatever, and actually then giving them a, a flavour rather than getting to the end and, okay, so what, what's next? Yeah, I, I do think that because I think, you know, as you say, I think the hardest thing is knowing what to do. You know, I, I, w I was quite a unique in a unique position, really, in that I sort of I knew that I wanted to be a lawyer after I finished sports and I'd you know, done my studies before I actually became a professional athlete. Um, so it was, that was quite an easy decision, whereas I think for the la vast majority, um, it's n not knowing what, what, you, what you're going to do or what you want to do. Um, so I think yes if something was was mandatory and you know or at least you know it's ma making them have a feel and to try various things to at least just get a feel for what what potentially they might might want to do in the future just just before we move on i wondered if anyone had any thoughts on any sports not listed here obviously we focused we can only choose four um you know that that was the um the requirements of the social media post I mean you could only choose four sports but are there any ones that anyone would think is doing particularly well, um, particularly I'm thinking in the US, maybe Sam, you might say the triathlon. Uh, well, I can, I can certainly speak for what we're trying, trying to do. Yeah, look, the, the professional triathletes organization is a very new entity. We were set up just a several years ago, frankly, to solve the problem that like so many niche sports, you get your amazing moment in the sun with the Olympic games, and then it really drops like a stone. And so you have this, these peak moments for athletes and then what happens for following three years. And there's a very big disparity between the strength of national federations, obviously, depending on the economics in which country they're in. So you might have a market like the US where you've got an incredible collegiate system, an incredible governing body system that does have um, welfare and the ability to provide welfare, but then you'll have smaller governing bodies that just don't have the resources. And so we've stepped in to provide that sort of in-between layer um, with an athlete focus. Um, so the entity is owned by the athletes we're quite unique in that sense that it's an athlete owned body alongside investors and so pretty much everything we do has the lens of what's going to be right for the athletes so it's quite unique in its model and something we're seeing beginning to pop up in in other sports for sure 
Uh, there's clearly an awful lot of interest in professional sport at the moment. And so the fact that a sport has been managed in a certain way, I don't think is an excuse moving forward into the future. And we're seeing that with all the venture capital and private equity money that's flowing into sport, that it's bringing better practice and athlete welfare is, is a I mean, prime example of you know, it's looking after the most important asset within the sport, and that is the athletes. Tom, if I could just make, just make a comment on the um, you know, on the survey results, and perhaps the reason for rugby coming out on top is, you know, as you mentioned, that the uh, obviously the, the risk element is seen as a lot higher in in, in rugby inevitably, and and um, and I think you know over the last few years, concussion has been a a major topic for for team sports and kind of rugby at the, at the lead of that. And I think because perhaps because they've made some developments in terms of technology to to try and you know, consider the, the concussion risks and how it can be dealt. Uh, you know, maybe something that, that has played on people's minds when they're you know, they're, they're nominating rugby as a, as a kind of leader in that area. Yeah, I think that would be uh, fair to say. Um, I'm just going to move us on. So the second question centred around risks to an athlete's earning potential. Um, and again, there was a very clear winner with 51% of our audience believing that the biggest risk was injury. Um, I mean, it, it's similarly to the, to the you know, rugby winning the winning, um, the previous answer, it, you know, it seems to me it's kind of the most obvious, uh, the most visceral, the most visible things. Um, that our audience have picked out as the, as the biggest risk. But I, I wondered if, um, if anyone had a different take on that. I, I agreed with the with probably <laughs> the majority um, from, from those options. Um, I think, yes, you know, as a, when you're an athlete, um, you are always concerned about injuries, niggles, um, and how serious they are and the impact they might have. Um, I guess another option to the four answers that, that you made available that, that I thought of as well was from a team sport perspective as also non, non-selection. Um, you know, suddenly um, you're not performing as well and I think that can have a, a big impact on your on your earning potential as well. Um, and then I guess uh, another, another th- thing I thought was that actually linked to kind of what we're going to come on to but with social media is you know the the reputational damage that you know if an athlete um says something that they shouldn't do on on social media or um you know is uh, does something that they shouldn't have done that can you know massively impact on their earnings because you know we've seen the likes of, of big named athletes losing sponsors um as a result of some of the things they've done and said um so yeah those are a couple of other examples that i thought do do impact on a on an athlete's earning potential one that i wasn't surprised is not covered um because it seems like it's very unusual within sport but certainly we've been surprised not to see it is um the simple question of having a family and it, particularly for, for female athletes. And we've been surprised as a new body at how little support there is in terms of maternity leave. Like in, in the corporate world, and David, I'm sure you'd agree, given your job, it would be unheard of not to provide maternity leave. It would just be, you'd be being considered a pariah as a company. And yet the vast majority of sports bodies don't provide that, even at the very top level. Um, so that's been surprising to us. And so we've implemented a policy where we don't believe that either male or a female athlete, but obviously the the biological impact on female athletes is so much higher should have to choose between having children and having a career. So we have a 15 month policy where, sorry, 15 month process where, um, uh, mothers are supported to allow them to have children and then come back to the top level of competition, which as you look at the reasons why many, especially on the female side, athletes retire, it's because of that simple fact, right? They're having to choose between a family and, and their sport. And we think in this day and age, that shouldn't be necessary. And Sam, what sort of support are you able to to give over that period? I mean, it, it, is it around keeping their kind of rankings at the same level, or, or um, how, how does how does it operate? Yes, it, it's really simple. It's the most important one you can get, arguably, which is financial. <laughs> um, and so, what we do is we we have a, a world rankings where we we rank the athletes, obviously, and then we have a process where we'll freeze the rankings of an athlete that goes through either paternity leave, it's much shorter, or maternity leave, obviously, it's longer. It's actually fifteen months long for maternity. So from the moment they notify us of being pregnant, we have a process where we freeze them in the rankings and they're compensated as if they were having a salary um, in, a, in a corporate environment. And 
uh, that allows 15 months was the number we felt was enough that it allowed the time to go away, have a child, come back and build back up to come back to the top level. Because that's often what we've seen. If you take tennis in the rankings, someone will drop so low and it takes a long time to get back up. And it's one of the things we wanted to, to support. I think that's a, a brilliant point, Sam. You know, when I was playing, um, I would never ever have considered <laughs> um, mm. being able to to have a child. Um, you know, there was never a policy in place, um, and it and it has been great to see the that UK sport have literally, I think, this year implemented a, a, a maternity policy um, for um, Olympic sports, um, and you know, it's. I know from conversations that I've had with other with athletes that are still um, still playing now that you know they have they have read it they have you know are seriously con considering it because before they just never would have would have taken it seriously or, or you know been concerned what what would it what would it have meant for them if they decided to have a child during their, their playing career. Great. So I'm going to just move us on. So the third question we asked was um, out of the following options, inflated earnings, social media exposure, competition schedules or bland slash player commitments, which of those has impacted athlete welfare the most? Um, now, Georgie, I think you wanted to jump in here straight away, right? Well, yeah, no, I was just going to say that I, I agree with the, um, the response that I think um, social media exposure has you know, massively impacted on athlete welfare. You know, obviously, um, social media has exploded over the last five to ten years, um, and I think you know it, it certainly is now um, a platform that is great for athletes. You know, in in you know, raising their profiles and their um, sponsorship opportunities, but I think it also um, definitely has a has its negative sides that I think can massively impact on a on an athlete and their, you know, their mental health in particular, you know, we see the likes of um, the high profile athletes and the abuse that they've, they've received over social media um, and the impact that can have. And so when, when we were building up to, to Rio in 2016, um, we as a team decided that we were all going to come off social media for the duration of the Olympics for that very reason that, you know, we, we all decided that we couldn't afford to receive, you know, one negative comment um, that you know that might affect affect us and you know knock your confidence in the slightest bit. Um, and you know, when you're playing in a tournament and you're playing one game day off, then another game, you kind of need to be be in the best mind mindset that you can be. And I think you know the impact that social media can have in a in a negative way. Um, that one comment compared to 50 amazing comments, that one comment is what you'll focus on and I think can really impact on, a, on an athlete's welfare. And, um, and yeah, so that's, that's my point for you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a good point, Georgie. I think, you know, athletes generally should, you know, it'd be good to get more advisory for them around it and, and sort of help them prepare better for it because I don't think I've met an athlete yet who ha doesn't receive lots and lots of negative comment, you know, for anything they do. I mean, you know, we're, social media has changed a lot over the years, actually. It's interesting, you know, many years ago, sort of the advice to athletes was, you know, on social, just be sort of quite bland, you know, don't offend anyone. And actually that's sort of the best way to, to work. And actually commercially, it made sense because, you know, it's, it's good for everyone. Um, that's changed now. And actually, I think for the better, because I think people value authentic opinions on things and actually, it's been it's been a bit of a driver for change across a few sports, which is great. Um, but it's still but it's still quite a nasty place a lot of the time. Um, so it's just just yeah if, yeah you just need so much sort of care and attention and, and, and to be able to help and guide athletes through it. Um, you know whether that's you know really sort of simple stuff around you know guarding some of the comment and sort of putting keywords on there that sort of stops a lot of the vitriol. You know with tennis for example because it's a sport that's heavily bet on, you tend to get lots of people who've lost, lost money on a match, then sort of, you know, giving lots of abuse to a player because of that. And, you know, there's some pretty nasty stuff out there. So, um, yeah, it's with lots of positives towards social, but it needs to be handled in the right way. Matt, do you, is there like a particular course? What kind of advice do you give um, to athletes in terms of like social media training? Yeah. Is there something I mean, official, something, you know, something special that you put them all on? No, not, not really. It's just, you know, we've, we've got lots of experience of it. You know, I think they, 
you know, our experience is probably the, the biggest sort of help, I guess, to it and the biggest guide. You know, we, we, we're sort of in contact with the guys at, you know, all the social platforms quite regularly as well. So getting from them best practice, you know, what athletes should be doing to help, you know, grow the profile, but also, you know, how do we um, stem some of the negativity around it? How can the platform help us? You know, I think everyone's in agreement that platforms probably need to do more um, in the space to try to help eradicate some of the, some of the nonsense. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just, you know, just being a good sounding board for our talent. And it's, it's something that, that comes up on a daily basis, really. So it's just working with them and helping them manage through it. Uh, and Sam, same question, really. Is there any kind of advice that you give to, you know, the athletes uh, involved in the PTO? So I think what, one of the interesting things about how social media has developed, as Matt was pointing out, is that it sports stars have almost become content creators as well as sports stars now and there's a real expectation on quality of content and at what point does that become too much of a distraction from doing what they're ultimately doing best which is to be the best possible athlete and certainly when when we got involved in triathlon we saw that as a potentially really negative path the sport was going on because as i said there's sort of the olympic games every four years that creates a big moment but outside of that there wasn't that much attention and so athletes were being forced candidly by their own sort of commercial need to create YouTube channels to have people filming them at all times. And after a while that becomes a big distraction. I don't think that's a, as much of a problem in, in more mainstream sports where that infrastructure might exist. And so for us, it's as much around providing the guidance of making yourself available, making yourself commercially viable for partners, but not at the expense of your athletics because, or your athletics capability, because that's what we all care about at the end of the day. Um, but it's, it's very easy in this day and age to get sort of sucked down the commercial path without prioritizing that. Um, especially when often the competition now is maybe YouTube stars that have got, you know, millions and millions of followers that are her terrible athletes, <laughs> but their, you know, their commercial value is in a different way. So it's really about sort of treading that fine line. And, and what we've been doing specifically is, is building out an internal social media team, content creation team that we can provide for the athletes. So rather than it being on themselves and having to think about that and creating shoots that we would meet them five, six times a year, go and create content for them, for their channels so that they can build up their profiles because all sports are built on the back of the personalities of the of the athletes that, that are at the top, right? And that, that will never change. Um, but allowing sort of the infrastructure and the ability to do that without becoming a, a distraction to their performance and then their, their welfare as, as to relate to the podcast, I think is really important because as you pointed out, it can create a very negative cycle very easily. I just wanted to pull out also one, one comment that we had from this. Um, someone pointed out that perhaps COVID-19 was actually the, the biggest risk to... Uh, to athlete welfare in recent years. I uh, just wondered if anyone had any thoughts. Obviously, a lot of athletes can earn, a lot of sports shut down. Um, and David, is it possible to kind of mitigate against that that risk of, you know, acts of God, I suppose? Yeah, I mean, obviously it comes from a, uh, a lot of different angles uh, here and, and, you know, COVID has obviously had a huge impact on, on sport generally and, and some of which has has been insured and, and uh, um, you know, a, a lot of which hasn't been insured. Um, I think from an individual athlete point of view, then you know, less likely to, to have had any kind of insurance in place <laughs> to, to, to cover um, you know, any financial loss. Um, and we're not really talking about financial loss here. We're really interested in the, the, you know, the the, the general weight welfare of the athlete. So I think probably in a roundabout way, um, Tom, I think it, it's, it's very difficult to actually ensure someone's, uh, kind of mental health in that, in that way. Um, you know, initially there would have been, you know, if, if someone's had a, a, a career has been impacted or finished as a result of COVID, then potentially, you know, that, that, that could be, could have been covered, um, at the outset. You know, it was, Unfortunately, the way the insurance industry goes going forward, COVID is now excluded from anything. And uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, once it's a known entity, then it tends to be at, you know, excluded until something sort of, uh, um, you know, until until the world gets more familiar with the risks around it. So, so I think, yeah, the, 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 there's there's uh, there's been areas where COVID has been insured, but I think going forward. Um, n not so much, but the, the unknown, the next big thing that comes along, yeah, potentially, uh, could, could be, uh, 
could provide some some uh, insurance to, to individuals. On the insurance point, certainly going through the COVID experience made us all aware of the impact of loss of earnings yeah. um, for athletes, sorry, obviously, um, and how it's just completely a wide open space outside of maybe team sports, where obviously you're receiving a salary. In the case of I mean, it's not just triathlon. I think it's almost any individual sport. Earnings went to zero during COVID. And the uh, I've spoken to many athletes about it. The ability to get, this is not just a plug for your insurance, um, the ability to get at an individual level loss of earning and even health cover is almost impossible for niche sports because there isn't a common body or way to do it. So it's certainly something we've had an interest to explore. We were forced to, and I say forced in almost like it was a negative thing, but um, in March of 2020, we paid out all of our rankings 10 months early because we recognized it was two and a half million dollars because we recognized none of the athletes were going to have any um, racing opportunity. And that was at least 60 to 70 percent of their earnings comes from racing. And so we did that as a stopgap. But we would certainly love to find ways that we can work with insurers that uh, that loss of earnings are covered in the future. Yeah, look, I, I, I ought to come back in on that one there, Sam, <laughs> as its director. And um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Individual sports, uh, it, it's much more difficult where you haven't got um, you know, the, the sort of player associations with funding from from their you know, national governing bodies or, or wherever, and, and uh, with kind of years and years of experience to support the the, the um, individual athletes. So it it is more tricky, um, and I think but I think injury wise, um, it, it it can be addressed on an on an individual basis, um, and you know there are, there are there are options there for for them. But you you've obviously got a, a smaller um, a smaller marketplace and, um, uh, and you know, a smaller group of athletes as well to go there. But I think it's, it, it's, it's really important for, for those who are playing individual sports to consider these things as well. Perfect. Um, and then our, our final question, you know, attempted a, a little bit of resolution in asking which stakeholder needed to take the lead in helping to protect athletes. Um, and in this instance, you know, the, Player associations came in came in top with with thirty six percent, but I suppose um, you know when it comes to athlete welfare, it's the responsibility of all stakeholders really to make sure that they're they're all doing their bit. So, I mean, I guess it yeah, just just on that, it's it's for everyone to play their part, isn't it? It's not just the player associations. Yes, that's their their primary purpose, but um, everyone needs to to make sure they're doing their part. Yeah, I would I would concur with that, um, but I think it needs to be driven by by somebody, and somebody needs to have overall responsibility. and And it's clearly I don't think it can be management agencies, <clears throat> just because of the. I mean, it, it differs from sport to sport, of course, but you know, there's lots of examples of, of not particularly good good agencies out there who are who are doing things primarily to make money, but not with a sort of duty of care or. Um, you know the athlete at the, at the heart of what they do. Um, you know that's pretty obvious. You know in our experience, you know, our agency was set up by by myself, but also Andy Murray, and and it was part part of his interaction and dealing with several agents that actually, you know, we thought, well, actually, hang on a sec, they're, they're set up to exist to make money, and then the athletes that have come second, that 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 shouldn't be that way, and you know. It's an all too familiar example, so I, I think yeah, you, you definitely shouldn't be leaving it in the hands of, of, of management agencies to, to for that. Sadly, although there are lots of good ones out there, by the way, including seventy seven. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I I agree. I think I think it is a collective um, collective aspect that you know. I don't think there's any one person that kind of can drive. Um, you know the athlete welfare fair piece because as we we've discussed it is so broad um, and I think players and um, athletes and their associations can help definitely help drive it but I think often they can only get to a certain point I think you know as Matt said I think from from my sort of personal experience I think it ends up having to be the governing body or the, the national federation that has to take an interest in it and I think the the, you know, often, so I'm on the Athlete Commission for the British Olympic Association. So, you know, we play a part in trying to, you know, raise the athlete voice and when there are specific concerns, trying to raise those points and, you know, speak to those who, who have the influence to make a change. Um, but fundamentally, often those things 
can only be changed by um, by the powers of be. <laughs> um, and you know, and I know it will differ between sports, but um, but that's that's my experience. I mean, ultimately, to add to that, ultimately is is the individual, and it's easier for an individual sport because they're used to taking a lead and taking ownership of their career. But you know, ultimately, it always comes down to to the individual, the athlete, right? And it's actually, it's about surrounding yourself with the right people and the right trusted advisors and having a long-term approach to things, um, you know, that, that, that tends to, to bear the best results, I think. I agree in, from an individual sport. I do think from a, from a team sport, often, yes, obviously, an individual will drive, you know, if they're having, um, you know, struggling with their mental health or anything like that, that, you know, they will be the one that is responsible for um you know ensuring their their athlete welfare but often in a team sport i do think um you are um you know you are you are under the control of of your management of your um governing body um and you know often their priority is um performance driven but i think you know of, they do also need to look at it more holistically and, and the athlete welfare piece fits into that it's also recognizing how quickly the sports industry is commercializing or professionalizing like it feels like a blink of an eye that rugby was an amateur sport um like it's it's yesterday like the highest paid athlete in the world last year i believe is conor mcgregor that's ufc didn't exist 17 years ago like it's moving really really quick and we've got to recognize that as an industry that just what's happened previously is not necessarily an excuse for going forward and we have to evolve as, as that comes um we might just be out of time there um so i just wanted to say thank you to everyone for for joining us um it's been you know ho hopefully everyone lis listening at home has learned something thanks to georgie thanks to matt thanks to sam thanks to david david i wondered if you just wanted to do, um, make any closing remarks yeah just to to thank the guys here for for their uh, contributions today um you know we've we're keen to uh kind of give some profile to the risks that are out there for for athletes um of all you know of all kinds across um team and uh, individual sports and uh, i think um i think the survey here has kind of raised a few issues for discussion and uh, thanks for your input really appreciate it everybody perfect thank you very much guys hope to see you again soon